Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, friends, readers, listeners, and viewers. From wherever you may be tuning in, uh, thank you for joining me on this Wednesday evening broadcast, uh, the day after Christmas. Uh, I wrote this yesterday on uh, a blog. Uh, Just wanted to thank everybody for the kind support throughout this year. I pray that I can serve you as the Father would have me do, bringing knowledge and Answers to those of you that have been diligently seeking to unlock the secrets of the gospel. And even though I don't celebrate Christmas per se, I do honor the birth of our Savior and what that has meant for me personally and collectively as world. And that any day that would recognize him with the praise and glory that he justly deserves is a good day in my book. And so Merry Christmas, all of you out there. I pray that the King takes you under his wing of protection. May he guide you and choose to lead you to the salvation that he so graciously extends to each one of us. God bless each of you on this day. And so those of you that have looked into the traditions 
that um, have been associated to Christmas with the, you know, the Christmas tree, the stockings, the different things, the Yuletide celebration. These different things are uh, connected to pagan traditions and that when the Catholic Church and Constantine initially um, put together and made made Christianity the religion of the Roman Catholic Church and the 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 province as a whole that um they merged the pagan pagans along with the Catholics along with the Christians under one banner and kind of put them all together and all of the traditions kind of overlap, but a lot of them were carried over from very ancient and Babylonian Norse traditions, and there's a lot of uh, even Santa Claus is a is a pagan tradition, and so you want to know about these kind of things because you want to you know know what you're involved with when, when you're doing ritual because that's basically what you know celebration of holidays is ritual and it's like when especially for young people that when you go into a concert and you're visiting all these different uh illuminati puppets these different uh, artists that have sold themselves out to the new world order and to that that whole agenda that you know flash the illuminati signs the the satan satanic signs and the uh, the 666 and these different things that um, that when you go to these concerts and these people are up on stage and they're flashing all these signs and they're doing all this elaborate stage set up and they're performing there in front of you that basically they are performing a ritual and that you being there at their concert whether you uh, realize or recognize especially if they are you know, dedicated to uh, that side of serving uh, evil and, and dedicated to that agenda, then you're participating in a ritual. And so you have to be careful what you are involved in because um, these rituals are very powerful and they open up gateways and doorways, which we don't fully, fully yet understand. And so just... That's all I wanted to say as far as that. Uh, this evening I'm going to cover a, a couple questions and we're going to talk about the fallen angels and the giants and help get, bring some clarity here to people. Uh, I appreciate all of the new listeners and for all of you that have been sending questions to me and asking um, you know, different things, always feel free. Um, please send me all... All your questions, I'll answer them as I can. I may not get to them. It may take me a little bit of time, but I will get to them eventually, and I will send you a response. Um, and I do appreciate your inquiries. And I appreciate your testimonies and your sharing your own life stories with me, your own struggles, your own suffering, your own, um, you know, we can all relate to each other's, stories because we've all been through the ringers of duality, you know, pushed through the ups and downs of uh, pain and pleasure and the full spectrum of that. And so, you know, we can empathize and have compassion for one another. Um, Okay, I wanted to address a question that I was starting to address in the last show, and this was talking about how it was that um, that Jupiter could be associated to Christ when it stands for a, a pagan, a Roman god, uh, Zeus or, or Jupiter, we know as the head of the pantheon of the false gods. But I tell you that in the sign of Revelation 12, where you have the virgin clothed in the sun with the moon beneath her feet, and the child within her womb, that that child is the planet Jupiter in this particular celestial phenomenon that plays out September 23rd, 2017. This is the sign of that Revelation 12. But 
in that particular sign that Jupiter is representative of Christ as the child within the womb. And I'm not telling you that um, th- just because, you know, I'm making this up in my head or anything, but if you study the whole series on the Star of Bethlehem and the show that I did on that particular series and the celestial phenomena that occurred in during the conception of Christ and also during his death and crucifixion, that there was celestial phenomena associated in the skies and that the star of Bethlehem was in fact the planet Jupiter as it played out in the skies during that time and that the magi, that the three magi that were these wise men, these astrologers that were seeking for this particular symbol, that they saw Jupiter rise in the east with the star Regulus, the king planet with the king star, and that as it was rising, Jupiter went into procession three times and spiraled around Regulus as in a halo, and that in its continuation of rising that it rose also in the constellation of the lion which is represent, representative of the um, the tribe of Judah and so these were the things that the wise men saw in the skies and they also followed it um, within the skies and so Jupiter was utilized by the father as representation for the conception of the king. And so if Jupiter is good enough for him to represent Christ and the conception of the Holy One, then it's fully good enough for me. Even though we do know that Jupiter, yes, uh, in the planet Jupiter, has been also associated with Zeus, and the Roman god Jupiter, which is also Zeus. But I just wanted to clear that up for you. Now, I had another question here. Let me get... Oh, I wanted to share this also. People always ask me, as far as what would be a good collection of books to begin with, if you're interested in starting to read all of the different texts that are available out there. If you feel like myself, if it's important for you to study all of these individual texts and to read them for yourself in their entirety, just even if you just read them one time, just so that you know the story. If you are interested in such collections, I'm going to post this in the chat room. This is one of the first collections that I had. It's a two-book two series. It's called the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. And I pasted the the link to the Amazon in the chat room. It's about $35 for each book. It's well worth it. There, It's hundreds of pages. And these texts also contain stories and information that you will not find available anywhere else. And James H. Charlesworth, who I believe he was a professor at Oxford, if I'm correct, don't hold me to this, but I believe he was a a professor at one of these high prestigious Yale, you know, these uh, Ivy League schools, and that he was interested in compiling and gathering and collecting the different stories that were then available and compiling them together in book form so that we could have them available. And so his two-volume set, The Old Testament Pseudepigrapha, is an incredible collection of work. It will keep you entertained for many, many, many months. And even for those of you that love to read, you can revisit this, these texts and revisit these stories 
and read them over and over, and you will find new information every time you go back to them. And so that's one particular collection that will introduce you to the pseudepigraphal works. You can also get um, the Lost Books of Eden or the Forgotten Books, the Lost Books of the Bible, the Forgotten Books of Eden, that this collection, this collection also contains the second book of Enoch and also the first, second book of Adam and Eve, um, all the the protoevangelian books about the birth of Christ, the early childhood stories of Christ, and also the stories of Mary prior to um, her immaculate conception and then bringing Christ into the world. Uh, and and there's so many. There's all these stories like like Paul and Thecla. There's Joseph and Asenus, which is an incredibly beautiful romantic story um, about Joseph being betrothed to the Egyptian princess and how it was that Yahweh approved them for marriage and how it was that they both did not and were adamant to not marry each other, but that they were in the eyes of God meant for each other and how it turned out to be just a really beautiful affair, incredible story. So many books out there, so many stories that you've not read, you've not even heard about. Uh, another group, for those that are interested in studying the Nag Hammadi Codices and the recently discovered text um, from, the, from the Nag Hammadi, you know, the collection that was found in 45, that these texts, the reason that these texts are important, and I'm going to do a show on this in a couple of weeks. The show is going to be on the lost 40 days. The 40 days of Christ, once he died on the cross, went down into Sheol, broke open the gates of brass, freed the patriarchs and brought them up into Jerusalem and brought them to resurrected life that for 40 days he and the the patriarchs that he resurrected, they were seen, spotted, and witnessed in Jerusalem and other places. And that there are accountings and that there are stories which come from this particular time. Now, the Nag Hammadi codices specifically are those secret teachings which Christ gave to his disciples, his apostles, after his resurrection and after his initial ascension into heaven and his coming back down to the earth in flesh form. For those 40 days that people were witness to him, even the apostles, they were witness to him. He came to show them that he was the way and the truth and the life and that they were not to be defeated because the resurrection, that was, that was the key. That was his defeating death. That was his conquering the rulers of darkness, the principalities, the powers of this world. And descending into Sheol and breaking open the gates of brass and forcing uh, Satan and hell to give up the saints because they weren't willing, they didn't want to, but they had to. They had no other choice. Christ went down, freed his, those that were his, and took them up into paradise with him. But for 40 days, they were witnessed in Jerusalem and upon the earth. And so I'll talk about some of those stories because um, there are books connected to that. The Nag Hammadi Codices specifically are connected to that. And then there are certain pseudepigraphal books like the Gospel of Barnabas, the Gospel of Bartholomew, uh, the Gospel of Nicodemus. These 
are associated with the Christ descent into hell and associated to those stories of his being witnessed in the flesh after the resurrection. And so you'll want to read those those stories as well. Um, but the book you want to get for the Nakamati collection would be the Gnostic Bible, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, B-I-B-L-E, and that this Gnostic Bible, it contains more than just the Nakamati collection. It also contains information and scriptures and stories that go goes back, ties to uh, the Cathars, uh, the Persians, uh, the Zoroastrians. I mean, just, it's a, a collection of, of ancient texts from different periods, different peoples, different cultures. And so it's another, you know, massive collection of information. Yeah, I was just taking taking a look in the chat room. Welcome, Sonny Yahweh and Mustang Sally and Jazz and Ran and Iraq and all the guests. We appreciate all of you. God bless all of you and I pray that you had a good Christmas. And all glory, all glory to our Savior and our Messiah, to Christ, to Yahushua Savior and Messiah for dying on the cross, for defeating death, for fulfilling his purpose, for coming into incarnation and living a sinless, perfect life, for knowing who he was and fulfilling that, and to living up to that, and allowing himself to be battered and brutalized and spit upon and beaten and and, and demonized and desecrated and and tortured and murdered, all for our sake. So, and if you don't have an appreciation for that, for what he did for us, anyways. Anyways, all right, we're going to go, because I want to bring some clarity. I had told you in the last show we did on the Kebar Nagas, uh, chapter 100, concerning the fall of angels. I spoke about how it was that we fell into the flesh, how it was that this group of angels that fell during the time of Yarit, that they were not the original rebel angels, but that after we incarnated into the flesh, after Adam and Eve fell from paradise, and we were forced to incarnate on the wilderness of the earth, and after the second world age began, six six generations after Adam, during the time of Yared, Enoch's grandfather, or Enoch's father, Noah's grandfather, that Enoch was told by his father Yared that a group of angels fell during his lifetime. Uh, and I believe that Yared means the descent. It has something to do with a reflection of the fallen angels descending and mating with the daughters of man during this particular time. But that what made their ability to procreate with the daughters of man was the fact that they had challenged the Lord to put them into the flesh. And then he did so. And having done so, it gave them the ability to procreate with human women. But the consequences of such an unnatural interdiction into the affairs of humanity would be a birth of a hybrid race of beings And that this hybrid race of beings would have a great, great, great impact upon the future, the legacy, and the history of the planet. To such a degree that we would bear witness to their construct, to their megalithic type structures, and to their 
establishment of cities and culture, uh, megalithic type structures, uh, places of worship, um, aligned to the stars, all around the world, that we would be witness to that. And that we would be witness and bear witness to the mythology of their everlasting imprint and effect upon not only the history of the earth, but the history of humanity and our own place and involvement upon this planet. Because as the Native Americans can testify to and can tell you about in their own mythologies and their stories and oral traditions, they give an accounting of having war, having been at war with these bands and these tribes of cannibal giants and how it was that they would steal their children and how it was that they would cannibalize them and that they were known to be cannibals and that they had the stench of devils. They smelt like sulfur. And that they ate their own dead. These were some of the abominations. They were cannibals. And even initially, and many people don't realize this, but initially, when humanity was created, and this was before the flood, we were not meat eaters. We ate, we were vegetarians, hunter-gatherer types. And we didn't eat the flesh of creatures or, or people. And that it was after the giants came upon the scene, the the result of this unnatural hybrid birth, that once they came upon the scene, um, that they began to cannibalize and to eat the flesh of creatures and to also drink the blood of creatures. And that was the whole reason why the flood came upon the earth. That's why the Lord judged the planet and brought on severe judgment and consequence. Just to review real quick one paragraph from the Kevin Nagas, because I want to make a question, I want to highlight something of this. For those that didn't catch the last show, it says this. Chapter 100, Keber and the Gods, Concerning the Fall of the Angels. And straightway there were given unto them with his word flesh and blood and a heart of the children of men. They were content to leave the height of heaven. They came down to the earth to the folly of the dancing of the children of Cain. With all their work of the artisan which they had made and the folly of their fornication and to their singings which they accompanied with the tambourine the flutes and the pipes and much shouting, and loud cries of joy and noise, noisy songs. Their daughters were there, and they enjoyed the orgies without shame, for they sinned themselves for the men who pleased them, and they lost the balance in their minds. And the men did not restrain themselves for a moment, but they took to wife from among the women those whom they had chosen and committed sin with them. For God hath no resting place in the hearts of the arrogant and those who revile, but he abideth in the hearts of the humble and those who are sincere. Now remember, it was just prior to the, them coming into the flesh that they just challenged the Lord to put them into the flesh, and they said that they would uphold to the righteousness of their first estate, and that they would not go a-whoring after the daughters of man. But what did they do? They got into the flesh and they succumbed to their lust. Okay, one final paragraph. This is interesting. And straight away God was wroth with them and bound them in the terror of Sheol unto the day of redemption. As the apostles said, he treated his angels with severity. He spared them not, but made them to dwell in a state of judgment, and they were fettered until the great day. The word of God conquered who had fashioned Adam in his likeness 
or form, and those who had reviled and made a laughing stock of Adam were conquered. This is the important part. And the daughters of Cain, with whom the angels had companied, conceived, but they were unable to bring forth their children, and they died. And of the children who were in their womb, some died and some came forth. Having split open the bellies of their mothers, they came forth from their navels. And when they were grown up and reached man's estate, they became giants whose heights reached unto the clouds, and for their sakes and the sakes of sinners, the wrath of God became quiet. And he said, My spirit shall only rest on them for 120 years, and I will destroy them with the waters of the flood, them and all sinners who have not believed the word of God. All right, specifically of interest in this particular passage. First, notice that they were given bodies of men, that they were transformed into bodies of men, that these particular watchers that fell. And that gave them the ability to be compatible in their procreating with the daughters of Cain. But because it was still an unnatural, and a, you know, it was spirit meaning terrestrial earth creature, that they were still not supposed to combine and to procreate that the hybrid giants that were born of this unnatural creation, that they weren't even born naturally. It says that they split open through the navels of their mother, that they split their mothers wide open in their birth. And so even their birth was atrocious and abominable. All right. So that gives you an idea now, also, somebody had asked me about Cain and whether he was the first hybrid. And yes, he was the first hybrid. But what you have to understand about Adam and Eve and their initial transformation and incarnation into flesh form on what would be the earth, eighth day that Adam and Eve, from Adam's time down to Noah, that our ancestors were of larger stature and had longer lifespans. Everybody knows about the longer lifespan. Adam lived 930 years, according to the text. But what people don't realize is that our patriarchs, from Adam down to the time of Noah, that they had larger statures, that they were giants themselves. And that the giants we're talking about that were born from their fornication with the daughters of Cain, who were also giants because all of the initial early people had larger statures, were larger beings, and had longer lifespans. And that was the reason for their longer longevity is because they had they were of bigger stature. And initially if you go back and you look into the archaeological and the fossil record, the geological record, you'll find that even dragonflies, even you know, insects during that initial period going way, way back, that all of the creatures during that time were of giant stature. They were of giant size. And so it would naturally make sense to realize, to come to the conclusion that, yes, even our ancestors were of a greater stature. So when you're talking about giants being born from giants, who can even imagine, you know? All right, I want to address one other question here from um, Fraser. Because Fraser, I'm not exactly sure. He, he, he wrote me this. He says, 
I wish you a very Merry Christmas. I'm writing you from Canada. I appreciate your research and radio broadcast. I live 20 miles up the logging road in Cascade Mountain Range, and every bit of valuable insight into the subject of true spirituality is very welcome. A week ago, my friend's brother was diagnosed with elevated glucose levels, and he seems to be losing his balance with short periods of blurred vision. Several months ago, I was listening to one of your archive broadcasts, and you had a guest on your show who had helped people naturally lower their glucose levels by dietary change. Could you please point me in the direction of where I might find that guest? Also, are your broadcasts available in Spanish? Um, I am looking forward to educating and interesting future listening to your show. Fraser, just so you know, my um, broadcasts are not available in Spanish as of right now, um, that I don't have that you know capacity or ability. Uh, but I do want you to know that one of my readers, uh, a friend, Maria in, in uh, Mexico, that she is currently and as time allows, is translating Sons of God from the English into Spanish so that we can make it available uh, in a bilingual format and provide it to, you know, that whole other part of the world. And so God bless her for her willingness and her, you know, her dedication to doing that. I'm, I'm so just grateful to her. And, and willing to help out in whatever way I can. And so I, I ask everybody to to pray uh, for Maria and, and and that she finds the time to to do that as well in, in all the other things that she does. And as far as a guest, I don't remember exactly. I've done so many shows with so many guests. Um, but if anybody is in the listening audience that has any idea, on how it is that you can naturally lower your glucose levels, please do send me an email, Zen Garcia, Z-E-N-G-A-R-C-I-A-2010 at gmail.com to let me know. And I'll be glad to pass that information on, to relay it on to um, the, uh, the other friends. Um also, another question that Chris Robertson had asked about Adam and their initial falling into the flesh. Um, can't remember exactly how he worded his question. But just to let you know, initially when we first fell, that even when Adam was first created and that the angels initially, when they first created they were created in hermaphroditic form, meaning that they were both male and female gendered, that they were complete and that they were whole in their fullness, and that everybody thinks, you know, many everybody considers that angels are male. But if you look back at the text, what you realize is that angels are actually hermaphroditic, meaning that they are both male and female and that they are non-gendered and that they may come across as certain aspects as being male or female, but they are, in essence, complete in their wholeness. And that it was only after Eve was separated from Adam that the initial male and female genders and the separation of genders came into being to such a degree that we find ourselves incarnating into male and female form and that we are learning through the duality of such polarity here as we learn, um, you know, having eaten from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and having fallen into incarnation into flesh form that we now find ourselves in male and femaleness. But when we return to our first estate, we will return back to this hermaphroditic nature. I was also asked by somebody whether there would be marriage in heaven 
and whether there would be, you know, family and children and, and all that. And from my understanding is, yes, there's family, but procreation, no. There's no birthing of children. There's nothing to do with the flesh that we will have graduated from such experience and that we will have returned to our first estate, meaning that we will be clothed again in our light vestures, reinvigorated by our bright natures. It will be a return to immortality into an immortal state of being, which is not connected to the flesh because the flesh is finite. The flesh is mortal and has to pass away and has to succumb to death. And so I hope that answered your question there as well. All right, let me check the chat room here. Okay, there are many, many, many different books out there. And for those of you that are interested in different um, different collections, just contact me. Hello, Sister Joanne, and yes, uh, Sister, I did call you. Uh, your daughter did uh, answer and pick up, and I guess she told you my name was Ben, which that happens to me a lot, but... Uh, I will contact you. I'll have some time probably later this week. But um, I would definitely recommend there's also there's a, a whole new collection of what are called the New Testament Apocryphal books, that these books are, are, are collections of um, newer texts that are, are related to the secret books of the, the New Testament. And so I would look into reading some of this. As well. uh, these, there's a, uh, a two-book collection of the New Testament, New Testament Apocryphon. There are two orange books. That these are interesting books as well. Uh, what are some other collections? Oh, uh, I find the Colburn Bible to be a very interesting read. For those of you that are interested... Um, in studying from the other perspective and getting insight from the other side of it. Because these texts were written from the Egyptian and the Celtic and the Druidic priesthoods. And they contain the books of wisdom and traditions and secrets that have been carried and hidden and, and coveted and protected for centuries. And so... and. This is another massive collection of information and work. I find the Oasipi collection to be intriguing, even though these are supposedly channeled texts. They have great insight into the destruction of Pan Atlantis. And they provide details on the prior times where you can't find a lot of that information. The Colburn Bible also gives great insight into this. And for those of you that are interested in studying about the destroyer and about Nibiru, um, it has many, many accounts of several flybys and ancient accords and records of our ancestors and the things that they experience. And it's incredibly poetic as well. It's beautifully, beautifully written. And also another thing I'd like to say about the Colburn Bible is if for those of you that are interested in like the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and in reading about, you know, dwarves and uh, things like that, that the Colburn Bible contains information about all the different races of being and, and like gives an account of the prior times, early history of humanity and their intermingling with not only the hybrid giants but also the pygmies and the dwarves and the elves and 
I mean, it was basically like Lord of the Rings, like medieval Earth, that the mythology, the stories, the dragons, you know, that all of that is contained also within the accounting of the ancient stories. Um, another collection of work that I, I recommend for people that are interested in studying about the prior times or wanting to know about Atlantis and, and prehistory, that you can study the work of James Churchward. James Churchward, who was an Illuminist. He was part of the secret society. Him and his brother, they were you know, part of these elitist groups in that his work gives great detail about not only Atlantis and Pan-Atlantis and Lemuria, but it gives great detail into the other ancient stories and oral traditions and mythologies, Native American stories, the Bhagavad Gita, the uh, Hindus, the, the the Far Eastern Indian, uh, the old Sanskrit text, the Mayan text, and their associations to this particular time as well. And so I would definitely, definitely recommend reading his books. He's got a series uh, based on the lost civilization of Mu. And he's also got a text called The Children of Mu, The Symbols of Mu, The Language of Mu. I mean, he's got like five or six different books which are all based on and focused on elaborating on this particular time and the events that led up to the destruction of this continent as elaborated by Plato and also in his accounting in Timius and Critias. And that for those of you who are now currently reading my book, my my latest, my sixth book, Sons of God, Who We Are While We're Here, that a lot of this information is contained there within. But that my new book that I'm currently working on called Pre-Existence in the Prior Time, that this book will cover this information and bring it out in a way that I don't think has been compiled together. Not not all these different loose connections. I mean, I think James Churchward he does a majestic and incredible job in, in all the things that he's done. But there has been so much more information that has come forth there's so much new information, so many new collections of work out there available to us. And most of you have not even, you know, yet read the book of Enoch or haven't even read the apocryphal books, haven't read, you know, the Wisdom of Solomon or the second book of Ezra or the Maccabee series. All of these books are so incredible and are so packed with information that will elaborate and fill in the details on all those questions you have yet remaining. For those of you that are diligent seekers of truth and diligent students of the word and the gospel, myself, I like to read the stories over and over and over in the different ways that they are presented. Jubilee, Jasher, uh, Genesis, the Colburn Bible, um, all the different, you know, the Pseudepigraphal, the Apocryphal, the Nagamati codices that all go back to the beginning and relate. Uh, the text from the Nagamati codices on the origin of the world is one of my most favorite. It contains so much information. And in that if you want, like I said, if you are an investigator of truth, you're seeking to solve a crime, that crime would be our 
fall into the flesh, how we ended up being here now and incarnated into flesh form. If you're trying to figure all this out, uh, Jasmine says, think something similar to Lazarus and the rich man. Yeah, if you're trying to figure out who you are and your place within it, trying to figure out what the difference is between the wheat and the tares, between the goats and the sheep, between the left and the right hand, between the broad and the narrow way. Because they're all connected and tied together. The wheat and the tares, the children of the devil and the children of the Most High, the line of Seth and the line of Cain, the children of Adam and the children of Cain, kingship and the priesthood, all these things, divine right to rule and service to humanity, all these things, they all connect to the enmity between the seed lines. So it's, that's why it's important for you to understand these things. That's why it's important for you to, to read the old stories, to go back, to look at the old information. Because when you compile it all together and pick up all the different pieces and put all the different pieces together on the table and link them together in, in what would be the underlying truth, well, you'll find out that what is truth that is revealed by the Lord and his word and his gospel is so very different from what is being taught as truth by the churches and the prosperity teachers and the uh, the wolves in sheep's clothing that are so just still leading the church astray. And then another thing what you're going to find is that the church leaders in the 501c3 uh, government-approved and accepted churches, uh, the government-sanctioned and um, you know san- these sanctioned network of churches across America, they work for the devil. They work for the New World Order. They're keeping you dumbed down. They're keeping you ignorant. They're not letting you know about the war. They don't even let you know about the enemy. You don't even know about the fallen angels or the giants or that whole presence upon the world stage. And if you just did research on the Nephilim and how it was that they were responsible for the birth of this hybrid race of giants and that these giants, were the ones that built all these megalithic structures we see all over the planet, crisscross everywhere, then you'll realize that Darwinism is a lie and that the whole thing of evolution being taught in our school systems that we evolved the monkeys, that that is a lie as well and that the truth of who we are and the reality of our ancient history and our ancient past is so miraculous and so just incredibly and impossibly uh, beyond what we can even fathom as reality that if we could embrace the reality of that story it would just be mind-blowing. It would be so mind-blowing, it would just leave you in utter awe. Because for those of you that understand truth and that have a grasp on it, that have the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and the mind to understand, and that can relate to what it is that I'm saying, and you understand the true reality of what we're dealing with, and how it was that the fallen angels involved themselves and and rebelled against the Most High, against the Creator, the Father of us all, and how they abandoned their first estate to come down here to, to lust after and to mate with the daughters of humanity. The story is incredible. 
And what is even more incredible is that we are coming up on the culmination, the 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 end point. We're coming up on the fulfillment, on the promise, on the separation, on the second coming of the Son of Man, and retribution, and harvest, and revelation, and revolution, and redemption, and salvation, and eternal life. And the separation of the wheat and the tares, the gathering of the sheep and the goats, the splitting off of the left and the right. So, for those of you that understand what I'm saying, and for those of you that are coming to understand the things that I talk about, God bless all of you. I pray that Yahuwah, Yahushua, Savior, Messiah, that the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you in discernment and fulfill you and fill you with insight and wisdom and instant knowing so that you can come to remembrance on yourself and your connecting link with all of this information and all of this truth and that you can apply it to your lives and that you can become responsible as a human being that has the awareness of who you are in the full remembrance of self as having the Christ within and giving yourself to that aspect of self and holding up the kingdom first in your life. I pray that you can all do this for your life, and I pray that your children and your loved ones, that they also wake up to this part and aspect of themselves, and that they embrace it wholeheartedly so that we can be the change and make the change and make the difference and example that for the for the children that are so seeking hope, role models, answers, and people to look up to. And they, more than anything, they may not realize this, but they, more than anything, they want their own relationship with the Creator. They want their own connecting link to truth and to revelation and to answers and discernment. And so I pray that for each one of you. Until Saturday. In Yahushua Yahweh's name. God